So why are you holding an Australian inverter? Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> No, that's um, a UK inverter. It is. No, um, it's just um, ironical that um, when we bought um, Salty Lass, uh, we had a budget of £60,000. And in that budget, we bought a load of stuff. And one of the things that we bought was a DC to AC converter so that we had AC power. And next week, we'll finally, finally be fitting it. <laughs> we spent most of the budget within two years but yeah next week we'll be finally fitting it fitting it so i thought that this would be a good opportunity to talk about our budget how we spent it where it went and you know typical costs and things like that So, <laughs> um, we've bought the boat and we've already done a video on how we bought the boat and there'll be a link to that up, is it that side? Yeah, we'll say, yeah. It's, that, we'll say it's that side, but it might be that side. It's not that way. Right. <laughs> um, what we thought we'd touch on is people ask us about the budget um, and how we managed to afford buying the boat and something, things like that. A lot of what we covered in the previous video, but what we're going to do here is just discuss um, the actual process why why we bought it the way we did mm, exactly it's basically the philosophy of what we were thinking when we bought the boat wasn't it Beverly yeah and I had this belief at the time that you could either spend more money on an expensive boat and do fewer upgrades or you could spend less money on a cheaper boat and do more upgrades and I believed at the time that the cost would work out probably about pretty much the same yeah because whatever um money you buy you know less on the whole you then have more stuff to do to upgrade it don't you really well i've come to the conclusion uh, from looking at people buying similar sized boats to ours that the cheaper the boat usually the less well maintained it's done and you've usually got a lot more maintenance to do it and it tends to be costly maintenance so i've come to the conclusion from looking at other people and the amount of money they've spent that actually buying a cheaper boat and spending more on it can actually be more expensive in the long run by the time you total all the bills up than buying a more expensive boat and doing less upgrades on the uh, other hand though yeah but the advantage of buying cheap and uh, doing the upgrades is that you can come into boat buying at a very cheap budget and then as time goes on if you've got say five six seven years you can do those upgrades when you feel fit when you feel able and do it in your own pace but you've got to think about it if you're coming like we were um at over 50 <laughs> into boat buying for the very first time we haven't got that time to spend eight years also we're not patient enough <laughs> no we have got absolutely no patience whatsoever what we wanted to do is we wanted to pretty much start sailing straight away didn't we bev we did Aha, oh, yippee doodah, we have got the sails up. Well, it's the end of the uh, first day of sailing Salty Lads and we have had all sorts. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we decided that we would go for the more expensive boat that needed less upgrades and less things to do on the boat. The first thing we did was we took our budget and by selling lots of stuff and downsizing and doing all sorts of things and cashing in a few policies here and there, we scraped together about 60,000 to buy Salty Lass. And that was our budget. That was it for everything. Yeah. And what we decided to do with that budget is we decided that we would have 75% of the budget uh, for the boat, which is £45,000. And we spent every single penny of it. Yes, we did. <laughs> On the boat. And that left us £15,000 to do the upgrades, didn't it, Bev? And also for other things. For instance, one of the things you've got to budget into your boat buying is your travel costs. Chances are you're not buying a boat just down the road. You might be lucky, but most of us aren't. 
yeah so you've got to think about your travel costs also um we spent money on a survey and how do you think do you, now that you've looked back how do you think the survey is it was it worth the money the survey was 500 pounds and i think it was worth every penny um the reason for that is um once again i've known people who've bought boats without surveys and they've turned up horrendous problems later and if they bought a survey the surveyor might have found the problem he might not you can say but certainly by not having a surveyor you're guaranteed the surveyor didn't find the problem so also, the advantage, of, the other advantage of having a surveyor is some um, yacht insurance uh, expects you to have an, a survey done, mm. uh, so that um, well, for insurance purposes. For really. insurance yeah. purposes. Um, but once you've had a survey, the good thing about the survey <laughs> is to actually do read it because in our survey, we had costs that we knew about, like. Um, the standing rigging we knew that we needed to do that didn't we Beth? we did so one of the things that the survey did mention was that there was rust on the exhaust elbow and the water lock um, but we didn't really understand that did we Beth <laughs> no you know uh, we looked at the water lock and we thought it was just dirt trapped under it or something like that and actually turned out it was eating it from the inside out and there's an episode about that up here as well isn't there and if you want the el exhaust elbow episode it's up here too <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it this way, it resulted in our pan pan! <laughs> so there are un unexpected costs because you don't know what you're reading in the survey. That's just part of it, I guess, when you're new, when you're new to boats, if you haven't had one before. Mm. If you haven't had one before, you'll, you'll be on it like, like that, so it's not a problem. But our budget was for the big ticket items. And those big ticket items were, in our case, standing rigging. Um, Which was something we had to do. Yeah, because the, the stuff we had here was 17 years old. Uh, autopilot. Um, we wanted AIS. Yeah, these are things that we wanted because our boat was a day sailor. Um, it went out for a maximum of like a week. Took at the worst, yeah. You know, at the most. I mean, the chart plotter, when we got it, the chart plotter was on a board that slotted into the door slot. And it wasn't really a great deal of use. <laughs> Uh, we wanted a better chart plotter when of course we now have this one here up here and um, we wanted an autopilot because they only went out for day sales they didn't need an autopilot they only out for a couple of hours at a time and uh, as somebody who has done we did um, was it 28 hours or 28 hours on the helm once uh, between us obviously yeah and it's like no we're not doing that again <laughs> no what, once was enough for that sort of thing <laughs> you know, um, and steering for that length of time there, there are only do. things once again that we weren't sure that we wanted but we got them like ais mm -hmm. you know um, now to be fair our ais once we had the chart plotter in place and we had the boats network in place and things like that the ais was quite inexpensive it was 400 pounds for the unit you plugged it in it worked mm. that was it um we also saved money um in other things like for instance we had a budget of about 1500 for the windows yes um and in the end we spent what was it about 250 pounds on the windows yeah but that was only because rather than opening windows we replaced them with closed windows closed windows which we're quite happy with yeah you know so there are ways that you can save money and then there was the day we discovered how much we needed solar power oh that was definitely a need and luckily <laughs> We fitted it and we got it all working, literally, just before we really put it to the test. Yes, that's true. And that leads us very neatly onwards to our viewer question of the week. Which is on solar panels. Um, this week's question of the week is uh, to do with our solar panels. Uh, one of our subscribers wanted us to do a review on our solar panels, how they're working and um, the pros and cons of all the bits and bobs that we did. So the first one is design. How did we design it? <laughs> well we designed it um, when we were in um, Peel um, and we designed it out of matchsticks. Oh yes. <sighs> That was a, a funny day, but never mind, we designed it out of matchsticks. And um, one of the things that I think about my design, uh, our design, it's uh, pretty good. 
apart from the fact that I would have more triangles. So basically, this strut here is perfectly in line with the strut behind it, which means that it skews like this. So what we did is we put um, uh, this um, braid in, which um, brings a compressive force um, into the design and that was enough to stop it wobbling but otherwise it just went <laughs> so not good the metal pole in itself was not sufficient for the bracing uh, we thought it would be but it isn't but you know that's the design if I was doing it again I would not have these in line um, if they were sort of like skewed like that I think they would be better. Okay in terms of endurance uh, because these have been up here for about two years now uh, they've done very well they've been through about a something like a, a dozen storms force nine or above each winter we seem to get about half a dozen coming through in this part of the world so something in the region of 10 or 12 very severe storms they're still here the steel has worked very very well and okay it's got a little bit of bounce in it as you can see but that probably saves it. Um, the panels themselves are still looking in good order. Uh, we keep them clean, we keep bird poo off them because it's acidic, not good. And um, the steelwork does need cleaning occasionally and we have a product for cleaning it. The only thing about that particular product is that it says to be applied in temperatures something approximating 20 celsius and it's about four today. <laughs> so, so we won't be doing it today. The steel is stainless steel which is a bad name for it it really should be called stainless steel and that would be a better thing it still stains it just doesn't rust like ordinary steel but it still needs cleaning and that's one of the little jobs we have to do um, we inspect it occasionally we look for wear on the bits and bobs that hold it together we check the grub screws uh, we check that the uh, tensioning line hasn't gone slack and things like that but other than that they have done very very well I've just been told to move a bit because apparently the pencil was sticking out of my head. <laughs> yes, I know. Beverly is a pencil head. I was a pencil head. I was a pen head. <laughs> yeah, you're um, a pen head. Okay, the other thing is, the, the other thing we were concerned about in endurance was the polycarbonate. Now, this is the stuff that people roof conservatories with, so it's supposed to be UV resistant. And I have to say, it has held up pretty well. Um, because we were able to cut this with a, a knife, it was quite straightforward to cut. The only thing that's really happened is, I didn't seal the edges of the panels. So I can put my finger under here. And we've got all sorts of green goop that has appeared underneath it. So from underneath it looks quite ugly. But that's just a, a cosmetic issue. Where the polycarb has really, really helped is um, cooling. One of the problems you get with a lot of these panels is they have nothing underneath them to allow them to cool. So as the sun heats them up, they're dark on top. They warm up and as they warm up, they become less efficient. Because this has a slight air gap and as the polycarb panels underneath, these panels don't get overly hot. And we've seen some tremendous uh, efficiency coming from that. There are two 150 watt panels. That gives us 300 watts. Our machine downstairs that monitors it says that we've had 262 watts peak power coming from it, which from a 300 watt panel is pretty amazing. So we're, we're very pleased with that. And we think this has worked very well in keeping the panels cool and keeping their efficiency very high. So that has worked out very well. Okay, um, now, because um, we have two pa uh, panels, um, you can either wire them in parallel or serial. Now we have done both because we wanted to find out which one's the best. Now, um, the watts out um, for both was exactly the same. The only difference is um, when they were in serial, the uh, watts, uh, sorry, the um, voltage was higher and the current was lower. Whereas when they're in parallel, the voltage is lower and the current is higher. But the watts was exactly the same on our particular thing. That's mainly because we don't have very much shadow going across. But shadow is the big thing that you have to consider because um, when you have a panel 
um, that's in shadow and it's in series, it actually knocks out both panels, whereas if it's in parallel, it only knocks out the one panel. But because of our, the way that we've got ours, back here don't really have much shadow over them we haven't personally found that to be a problem um, during the summer we can go on the solar panels pretty much all summer long and not need to do anything else but when it came to September time that is when we needed to put the engine on just to keep the batteries topped up. To be fair, that was this September, which was unusually overcast. It was unusually overcast. And um, also last year, we hadn't, um, we were only using the one single charger rather than the two chargers like we are now on the AC to DC converter. So the solar panels were topping up the batteries all last winter and they were doing a great job but this particular winter has been particularly overcast and that's why they were struggling which is why we swapped the um the way that the dc to sorry the ac to dc converter worked um to make that more efficient but no i'm really pleased with them and uh, i'm hoping that they'll do us a good few summers in the future